So I welcome Padma to the stage. Thank you so much to Michael and, and, and his patience and graciousness while waiting a potential talk topic and title. Um, so I'm going to leave a bit more mystery to this as I get started. But firstly, I wanted to check in on how you all are doing. How are you? Good? I, on, one more time. How are you? Yeah, you're pumped. That's awesome. I'm going to do my uh, obligatory click test mode. Okay, that's working. <laughs> this dog is my spirit animal and it's just living its best life, doing its thing. <laughs> Still going. Go, go, go. So great. So, hello, I'm Padma. Um, as Michael mentioned, I'm the GM at Pet Rescue and I've worn a few hats over my time. I, um, I actually come from a design and development background, so back with, uh, casting our minds back to Amy's talk about when it was CSS versus tables as a thing, I was part of that era. No one try and guess my age. Don't worry about that, just uh, skip on by. Um, but I was a designer and developer. I also ran a, a digital web agency for about 12 and a half years. So that, that was pretty cool, super eye-opening, massive life world opening experiences because of the amount of different websites that I worked on. And I was actually part of about 2,000 website projects during that time. So a few, a few. Then I moved into product leadership and design leadership in a role at Seven West Media, where with that role, I was part of a software engineering team. And I have something in my eye, which is really just not the best time for this. So I'm going to then move on to introducing my dog, Mash. Mash has absolutely nothing to do with this talk, but I wanted to show you her little tie that she wears. She comes to work with me. It's great. That's my emoji story. I've worn many hats travel around a bit, but that's a really recent thing for me. Um, I have lots of hobbies. I love sports and I love music. I, I love getting into the outdoors. I'm a really active person. Ooh, was that a car sound? Yeah, I could. that wasn't me. That wasn't part of the talk. But here's the reveal. I want to talk to you all today about levelling up, becoming a potential super dev. And this topic is one that I suppose just through conversations that I have with various folk along the way, I get inspired at various times when I do have these conversations that are just epiphany moments for me. I was inspired by Jess yesterday. <laughs> Jess said in her talk yesterday, well, she actually she left you all with this parting message to go forth and make Yep, I don't want to get the quote wrong. Go forth and make the web a better place. And to that I say, here, here. Can I get a collective here, here? Yeah, here, here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I never say here, here. Why am I saying here, here? It's because I'm giving a talk. Anyway, so I wanted to actually take this opportunity to amplify this message and really break down what does actually make a good dev. I'm not going to talk to you about the TEDx dev, dev today or the 10 times. There was a bit of a bit of banter that happened about it last night, but um, I will scoot along. So of course, I go along to my trusty friend, Google, and I start typing in, um, what, what did I start typing in? Level up as a, with the intent of putting in developer, but trusty internet knows me well and preempted with level up as a person as well. So I thought this is really interesting and the juxtaposition of this is exactly what I'm going to wrap my whole talk around. The internet also delivered this tweet and this tweet happened a while ago. Eric Elliott did, did a little blast out um, asking folks about, uh, asking folks to think about the most extraordinary, most extraordinary developer they've ever worked with and name three of the qualities that impressed them the most about them. So a few guesses as to what these qualities could be, but let's, let's, let's see what his survey results came up with. The top five qualities, communicative, efficient, collaborative, 
committed, honest. Yeah, these are good. The top five traits that came out of this survey, problem solver, skilled, mentor slash teacher, excellent learner, passionate. These are all pretty good things. I, I think um, they're, they're fantastic, in fact. They're, in fact, fantastic to have in any professional who's working in, in the industry or any industry. So I give that a solid Han Solo, not bad. Yeah. <coughs> so we don't, I don't disagree with any of those points, but I wonder, can we do better? Maybe. Possibly. I have, I have some theories on this. And this is based off me working with a lot of amazing developers over the years. Some were really good, some were great, and some were unforgettable. And the reasons that they were unforgettable for different projects or different products that we were working on really varied between them. So I thought, I just wanted to assess what that looked like for the shape of a developer that I would want to work with again in the future. So hear me out. Better devs are slow, are selfish, are lazy, like to argue, <coughs> and write bad code. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think, yeah, that, um, yep, that's the answer to the talk and we're all good? Does it all make sense? Thank you for coming to my talk. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, let me break this down. Don't boo me off the stage. Please, please, please don't boo me off the stage. I'm very nervous up here. Uh, <laughs> so let's break this down. Better devs. Better devs are slow, in my opinion. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Do you hear around the workplace that you're in or workplaces that you've been in where people say, oh, look, they're such a gun dev. They smashed out the tasks. They're super fast. Is that something that you hear? Like around? Yeah, a few nods. Yep. Hmm. S I'm skeptical about this. What are they actually trading off for this speed, this fastness um, that we're praising for? Hmm. Was there enough time for problem solving? Was there enough time for planning? Planning how we must might actually test out test this out. Did they get a chance to powwow the with the team and figure out why we're doing this piece of work in the first place? Or did they just pick up a ticket and just smash it out? Did we ever stop to figure... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me run that sentence a little better. Did we ever stop to figure out if we were coding the right thing instead of just writing the right code? And then what happens in the future when someone else comes in to work on the same site or the same product as them? And people are going through and going, oh, I can't navigate through this. Oh, what a mess. It's been left as a mess. And I wonder if the, the thought of a, a fast developer is, in fact, success theatre that in fact we're not actually getting through um, and making the quality type of decisions that we, we should really be affording to ourselves, especially nowadays. Um, so a lot, of, yeah, a lot of the devs that I've worked with in the past who are really, really excellent with this p piece of it, of being slow, was to actually stop the team and pause and say, is, you know, let's actually get all of the facts together. Let's not just do the, um, you know, the fast track it through and cut, you know, cut hours and whatnot, and let's actually assess this. So, Bill Jordan said it really well in this quote. I'm going to read it out for you. Odds are far better than good that your high performers are achieving what actually appears to be high levels of productivity by building technical debt into the application by taking shortcuts, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And this part of it is pretty important because sometimes people don't even realise that especially if it's a culture that's perpetuating in the workplace where it's just smash it out, get things out the door, deadlines, deadlines, on to the next thing, uh, then of course that's going to be celebrated and that's, that's the hustle that we're going to be involved in. So I look at this and I think that's why I'm the sceptical snake over here. <laughs> you get the point. Number two, trait number two. I believe that... Better devs are selfish. 
Okay, so this one I want to unpack a little bit further. Do you ever hear this around the workplace or have you heard this around the workplace before? I worked eight hours today. Well, I worked 10 hours. Well, I worked 24 hours. Well, what up with you? <laughs> um, or even, I have no life outside of work. And actually, these statements, oh, skip forward. Uh, these statements, what are they really perpetuating here? Um, because we hear it often, and I heard it a lot through agency land, and that's something that um, towards, towards actually looking at creating a healthier culture for everyone, I wanted to literally just beat it out of people. It is not a badge of honour to work yourself to the ground. Why are people wearing it as a badge of honour? I question this. There's a term for this, the term that uh, encompasses some of this, called presenteeism. I don't know if you've heard of it. If you, if you have, then um, please humour me while I'll read out the meaning again. The practice of being present at one's place of work for more hours than is required, especially as a manifest manifestation of insecurity about one's job. Hmm. That's not really the culture that I want to see in workplaces. Um, I don't think it's a healthy one, but that's, that's my opinion. Because when I hear people say, work is too busy, I'm so busy, I'm working really hard, what I actually hear is that if I'm always busy and needed, then I'm valuable. Now, I want to just pause on this, this moment because this was me. I was a workaholic and I am a recovered workaholic, um, but it's a work in progress because of the things that were affirmed to me as I was coming through the junior ranks, as a or constantly connected, and things got even worse when I got my first laptop. So, come with me on this journey. What will happen if you leave work on time? You'll leave work on time. Time management and communication will also improve. Well, that's not how you pronounce communication. Um, yes, these things will improve, not only from your end of you going, okay, well, hey, I need to actually wrap these things up before I head off for the day, knowing what's coming ahead for tomorrow. You start to actually map out those things. Between your teammates, communication gets, gets, gets stronger as well, because you have to be more diligent about it. If you want to clock off and be unavailable, then you start to plan out those things a little better. If you're client facing, if you're a freelancer, then this communication helps in actually building that trust and actually setting those expectations and not setting the expectation that you're going to be the slave to your emails and notifications. You get time for things that are important to you. I'll talk more about this later, but it's a pretty important point to actually go and take a, uh, take a moment to, do, to figure out what is important to you. What are your priorities? You'll get, to do the, the, you'll get time to do the other things that you enjoy. And if you love your work, that's great, and I, I applaud it. I love my job too. But also, there's the prioritisation of all the other things that we might want to juggle, and there's only 24 usable hours in every day, really. The workload will adjust. That's the other point of this. This is the thing that will just change the world. The world around you will just change to suit the boundaries that you set. Uh, and I... I I really want to emphasize, emphasize <laughs> words, I give up. <laughs> I really want to empathize, em emphasize, thanks for coming with me on this journey, um, on this, because there was a point where I had to make a huge change in my life and go from working full time, full time, but being very present um, a lot of hours, to cutting down to three days a week. And for those two days, that I wasn't there anymore because I set my boundaries and I wanted to focus on other areas of my professional development, two full-time team members got hired. Two to replace my two days. That was quite an aha moment for me. So how did I do that? Well, not how did I do that, but how did I actually start to set some boundaries for me? Um, I started to, because I'm quite, you know, a, a commitment-driven person, um, I booked some after-work appointments. If I had to get to, one, get to an appointment, I'm paying for it, I should go there. 
uh, regular routine with fitness classes, meeting people for, for rock climbing as an example. I didn't want to let those people down. I didn't want to let my work folks down, but I had different, uh, different competing priorities now. So I had to actually go, okay, well, I've made commitments here and I've made commi commitments there, and then I go forth. So I really committed to that notion of setting my own boundaries. So I do believe that better devs are selfish, but in the selfish notion is putting themselves first. Better people who are able to just function <laughs> um, at a really great healthy baseline put themselves first. There's nothing more important Honestly, there's, there's not a single thing that's more important than putting yourselves first. Even if you have dependents, if you're not able to take care of them, then that, that doesn't work either. So you are the number one, and I want you to believe that. So spending the time on the things that make or bring you joy and make you uniquely you help to develop and hone your human skills that then you can bring in into your passion points of, of work as well. It seems pretty obvious, but sometimes we need to prioritise and reprioritise. Maybe we want to... <laughs> who wants to create an app for this? Um, maybe we want to actually sort by the things that are most important to least important, and this will look different to everyone. Um, and that's why it's so wonderfully unique. But then there's the staples. There's the, the hierarchy of needs, Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, where you need food and shelter, water, um, then safety, security, and then the, we lead into things like the sense of belonging and being part of a community. This is a great community, by the way. So these are the, the things of human needs, these are basics. So, you know, what if then we sorted it from um, most investment time that you spend into least investment time? What does that look like? Is what, you know, if you were to actually do that based on the time that you actually commit to these um, self-enhancing practices, um, what, what, what does the order of that look like for your life? So I will leave you with that as a, a ponder. Now moving on to better devs are lazy. Yeah, <laughs> I believe that they really are. Um, and you, I'm sure you would have seen this in your paths um, previously at some point in time. Um, not specifically this meme, but <laughs> now it's in your path. <laughs> Philip Lenson said it best in 2005. 2005. <laughs> lazy, because only a lazy programmer will avoid writing monotonous, repetitive code, thus avo avoiding redundant... <sighs> Du thus re avoiding redundancy, the enemy of software maintenance and flexible refactoring. Makes a good point. Who loads up on the, well, actually single-use plastic, but who loads up on shopping bags as they're going out of the car now and just tries and lugs them all in at one go without leaving any behind? Me! <laughs> me. I believe that better devs also like to argue. Positive friction, like this rug that tried to trip me over, um, can definitely, definitely lead to better outcomes. It can create meaningful conversations. So why not create those healthy, safe environments for arguments, for people to express their diverse background viewpoints and different experiences that can actually contribute to this, this healthy decision making? Why not? Sometimes there's unhealthy arguing. It's not great. Um, a bit of bike shedding that happens that isn't as productive as, as one might love it to be. But there's other times where it can really, really change the, the type of conversation that you're having as your responsible builders and makers of products that people are using. This is where you get inspired to ask these questions if you slow down and take this moment. You know, can, can, can what we're building or can this feature cause harm in any way? If you're building or if you're working for, well, with building up online communities, what does the code of, conduct, co code of conduct look like for that? And Jack's being part of creating a great code of conduct for this event, but in the same breath, right, it, it, that should be something that's a, a written standard as a baseline for, you know, guidelines for everyone to work by. What, you know, what is your value set around that online safety and community? Um, are, you building, are, they, are you having those conversations when you're talking about features that deal with people's security and privacy? Chance to question it. Can everyone access it? Is it inclusive? 
are we building this software for many? Are we, are we building it with um, Microsoft's inclusive design pattern in mind, um, as an example, um, of solving for one person, but being able to extend that to many? These are, the, you know, these are great things that can be assessed and really healthy when people are prepared to argue about it, when people are prepared to really stand by what they believe in and go, you know what, I, I think we need to have this conversation because it's important. Um, just because someone hasn't said it doesn't mean other people in the room aren't feeling the same. So I definitely want to leave you with that thought. What's the most ethical approach we can take with this? There's a few um, tweets going around at the moment uh, about dark mode versus not dark mode and why bother investing in dark mode. And if there is a, a very viable approach to looking at it from a performance perspective, but then also an accessibility perspective, then it's time to have opinions about these kind of things. And having an opinion doesn't mean you have to be a poo head about it. <laughs> you can actually just voice your opinion based on the knowledge and the information that you have at hand, the experiences that you've developed. Uh, I can't remember who said it, and I feel really awful for not being able to credit this, um, but the, the notion of having strong opinions but holding them loosely, so strong opinions loosely held, maybe that's a mantra that we can take through into the types of conversations when we want to, you know, get a little, get a tiff on with a bit of argue. Argue's good. So everyone will have unique perspectives to bring, but it's really important that the environment that you create for the team and that forum is safe, it is welcoming, it is inclusive, and that it gives the chance for people to actually have the opportunity to have the microphone and speak up. So there might be some allyship required by everyone in this room and all of the participants in the conversations that you have. Maybe you need a bit of a, like a playbook before you embark on um, you know, these healthy, frictionful kind of conversations. It's good to have differences of opinion. Healthy banter is good. Better devs write bad code. Yeah. Hell yeah. Who's never written a line of bad code? Who's written a line of bad code before? Oh. You know how I said I've been involved in over 2,000 projects? Oh, there's evidence of a lot of bad code out there by me. Um, cool. I'm, gr I'm really, really happy that you all have gone, yep, I, I ad admit and embrace that. Because it's just the way it is, right? We, we aspire to this state of perfectionism when it comes to anything that we're doing. Um, there's just this quality over, well, yeah, th th this quality approach that sometimes just a little bit better is better. Um, so I want to explain this a bit further. And it ties into the lazy point. Um, why put in a bunch of work and investment in early when you could actually ship code fast to learn, to actually, to actually develop those learning skill sets, figure out what, how your users are interacting? This is the notion of MVP, right? Um, why not uh, be less afraid with how CICD is happening to actually get it out there? The, the, bef by the time it's in production, it should be tested with your testing guidelines, your, you know, what you're actually holding true as your values and your principles and your standards. You shouldn't be afraid to necessarily just ship code fast and see how it performs out in the wild. The other part of it, and this is, this is about that, you know, that conversational piece of um, how people interact uh, really uh, healthily in a team, by also being able to expose some vulnerability here, some of the best devs that I've worked with, the, and they've been super, super senior, um, full stack, Karunis, like all the things, right? But the best ones, they, they were there to own up and go and be vulnerable and say, oh, I messed up, I, I totally, um, totally misspelled that, or I totally approached this in the wrong way, but this is what I've learned, and these are the learnings I can get from it. And not being, uh, not being really super defensive if, if someone says there could be a different approach to actually doing this. Maybe we can look at, the, yeah, look at optimising it. Maybe we can refactor it now rather than wait until later and pay back that debt later because maybe we won't come back to that. 
So having, having that trust amongst um, your dev colleagues is so super important. So they're the ones that are open to being the teachers and mentors, but also constantly the students. That's a pretty rad person to be around. In summary, I believe that the five traits of a super dev is that they're slow, they're selfish, they're lazy, they like to argue, and they write bad code. Does everyone agree with me on that now? <laughs> Does anyone disagree? <coughs> Yell out. Let's have a healthier uh, argument. <laughs> OK, well, I, uh, hopefully that I've left you with some food for thought in that area. So I suppose, yeah, in summary, we've gone through slowing down, asking questions, <coughs> making fully informed decisions based on the information um, that you have at hand. and applying some grace to yourself because we don't know everything straight away, document the trade-offs, know when we're going to actually take responsibility and paying back that pet debt and making those agreements to not only yourself but your teammates and then also your clients if you're working with clients or pro your product team if you're working with your product team. Um, knowing the difference between building the right thing versus building things right making some trade-offs and way-ups there of you know, when we're actually going to go whole hog with it um, versus using some data and inputs to actually inform the deci decisions we're making before going ahead. Having a high level of self-awareness and life balance, super key. Um, you, can only, you can only perform at your, your best if you are looking after the tool that helps you perform your best, and that's from your mind through to your physicality as well. And recognising um, and correcting the types of things that we praise for in dev culture. If you, if you see it, maybe say something. If, it, if people are like, oh, yeah, they're gone, and yeah, I'm working my you know, 20 million hours a day, even though that's not physically possible, um, yeah, maybe just tap people on the shoulder and go, oh, well, Let's see if we might be able to redistribute this workload. Um, how might we be better? How might we improve prioritization rather than just doing all the things like it was a laundry list? Um, and just you know, being more mindful and responsible for that um, because that's you know the type of culture that we potentially are perpetuating just by giving someone like a by not saying anything or even giving someone a high five and a pat in the back for just the hustle culture and smashing themselves to the ground. Um, I'm not, I'm not keen on that, and when I went through my aha moment, my wheel didn't feel so um, awful. I was actually able to breathe and spend the time on the things that are important to me, things that made me into a better person, and it made me into a better person who was able to then perform more effectively at any of the professions that I've taken a hold of. And I've seen this change happen to a lot of people who I care about and people who have, been in, who have been in my care as well once they paused and made that decision and took responsibility for their own health and their, their own well-being, the difference it made, phenomenal. But change is difficult, it's tricky, um, it's challenging, it takes work, but all good things come with hard work. We can do it and we can just support and encourage each other. So leaving you on this note of, yeah, thinking about levelling up as a person at the same time as levelling up as a developer, it goes hand in hand. I don't think we need to decouple these things and thank you, Google, for that. Um, I'll come back to this one. But I'd love for you to share your dev emoji story with me as well and I'd love to just see what things that you're interested in. You can tweet me at the underscore Padma. Um, yeah, and if anyone wants to party tonight, I'll still be in town. I was working really hard on my talk last night, so that Michael would be proud. Um, so, yeah, I'm up for a party. Please see me afterwards or tweet at me. Thank you for listening. I'm going to leave you with this one. Yay! Thank you. Thank you.